My name is Li Ling and I'm a pole dance instructor. I work with a group of cancer survivors and seniors above age 55 and I teach them pole dancing. My name is Yan Yun. I'm a visual artist and lecturer. A lot of my works deal with my body and I use it to tell stories. I'm Nina, I'm a life model and an artist. I model for animators or sculptors or painters, uh, sometimes nude, sometimes in costume. It's a very interesting life and then you just meet this group of people who um, see nakedness very differently from what the general public sees it as, you know. So to me, I, there's a difference between nudity and nakedness. For me, the female body represents strength, power and confidence. And in the pole dance class, we always tell the students to be comfortable with what they have, to accept their own bodies, whether they are fat, thin, tall or they have some birthmarks. The female body for me is a mode for me to tell my story and that is one that I have agency on and also it reminds me of the different women in my life, my mother, my grandmother and all the different kind of relationships I have with them. Um, I also think a lot about how to present a female body, what it means when someone sees it and what it means to work with a nude body because I teach life drawing as well. The female body, what it means to me, it's my body. Lo. It's every. It's mine. The the state doesn't own it. No government owns it. Parents don't own it. If your partner doesn't own it, nobody owns it. It's mine. And however I want to present it should be left up to me. Whatever I want to do inside of it should be left up to me. The shapes and the gravity of the forms is very beautiful. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I so wonder in flesh. real life, is that really her shape? Yeah, she looks like a full-bodied woman, right? Like with bigger yeah, hips right. and, and she's got calf muscles. Yeah. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I believe like when this was made, 1949, I think if I remember correctly, um, Elizabeth Choi went to the UK in 1946 to receive an award and then she met the, the sculptor mm -hmm. Dora Gordon who is this Estonian Jewish uh, sculptor who's based in London and then they built a friendship mm -hmm. um, and they decided to, to kind of have this like artistic, artist model relationship mm -hmm. between the two of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And as we know, Elizabeth Choi is the war heroine mm. um, who like, delivered medicine and you know a lot of aid for the people um, during World War II. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I think maybe there's the bond between her, so the, the fact that they went through war. Mm. And I mean, the Japanese not hating the Chinese here and then and to be, she's Estonian Jew, right? The artist, mm. so yes. with the Holocaust, yeah. yeah. Do you know why the artist chose bronze? I think that was just her practice. Her sculptural practice involved a lot of uh, bronze work, but I do know that she uses other materials as well, like for her works. But I guess with you know, bronze is very long lasting. It's also mm. you know a, a material that can be outdoors. As a lay person, I would have thought that maybe the artist chose bronze because it sort of says something about Elizabeth's character. Mm. It's strong, it's hard, and mm. despite all that she's gone through, she emerged mm. still, you know, normal. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. And just the scars from, like, I think, is it like scars from the war? Is it that like her skin is very textured? I mean, I want to bring up the idea of the female gaze, mm -hmm. especially since, you know, Dora Gordon and Elizabeth Choi, both women, and they have a friendship between them mm. as well as a kind of an art relationship mm. being a subject as well as an object, if mm. you think about it, um, and the artist who's looking and seeing and painting um, this model. So in, in this sculpture, this relationship, I think it's quite interesting because we, we when you look at it, when there's a female artist painting a female model, they would see things, mm. um, more specific things about the body that sometimes get overlooked. Mm. Yeah. Do you experience that, you know, as a model? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I've, um, it's quite obvious sometimes they may, like, um, especially established artists or trained artists, right, uh, and they're older. The women artists and the male artists tend to, even if they use the same medium, they will, 
just draw di- differently. They just present my body on paper differently. It's very interesting to see that. Yeah. So there's a difference between a female gaze, yeah, uh, the female gaze and mm. the male gaze. Mm. So if a female was looking at this picture, they will see this to be quite natural because they see the indents that you get after mm. you give birth. But maybe if a man did this, maybe that part would be very smooth. Mm. That's mm. possible. And maybe yeah. the breasts will be bigger. You also mentioned a bit about the scars on the body mm. as well. Uh, yes, because I learned from a friend that after you give birth, apparently the lower abs, there's, there's an indent because it has to separate, for, separate pregnancy. Mm. For, for you to deliver. And they say that that scar remains forever unless you work on your lower abs mm. before you work on your upper abs. Yeah, I learned that from a friend who just gave birth because she does classes with me. Mm. So whenever I work on the upper abs, which is the body moving forward, she will just sit on the trampoline and she will not do anything. Mm. But when I do leg raises, which is working on the lower abs, uh, then she will do. Mm. But she still hasn't shown me that line. I have to say that this piece really speaks about like women friendships, you know, mm. given that it's a Women, a female sculptor mm. who is working with a subject that is, you know, that she's not just familiar with, they also have a friendship. Mm. They build a friendship around the work. I like her confidence and her attitude. It's like she's not shy that she's naked, mm. uh, whether or not she knows or doesn't know that the person was doing it. Mm. She is very proud. She has self-esteem and she has confidence in holding her body. Mm. Yeah, Because most people when they are naked, they usually like, they, they try mm. to hide. Somehow looking at a naked woman reminds me of um, my work with cancer survivors. Mm because some of them go for double mastectomy or single mastectomy. Mm. And mm. also at the post studio, uh, we have women of all shapes, all sizes, mm. and we try to teach the women to be confident with their bodies. It doesn't matter if you are big, small, big boobs, small boobs or whatever, um, so that it gives what we call um, studio love. And we try to tell women to be confident with whatever they mm. have and not to feel embarrassed. Mm-hmm. I do really like the head wrap detail. I think that is very, very nice. Huh? Every time I, want, I see these kind of paintings, I always think that do the women know that they are being like painted or observed? You know, it's a bit like voyeuristic lens. Like mm. that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I definitely won't call this a portrait mm. because I don't think that the identity of the women, uh, you know, like that's not the point of the painting. It's mm. more what they're doing with the weaving. Mm. I don't mm. think they know that yeah. they are being uh, painted or even photographed. <sighs> yeah. yeah. I don't know whether the women are actually real. The face is a real face or an imagined face because who knows now all these things, right? If we look at these paintings from our perspective mm. now and looking at the context of what they were hoping mm. to do at that point, it just encourages people to reinvestigate the history mm. of paintings and images mm. that um, how beautiful paintings are made need to be also considered and who is, you know, who is who's involved in Yeah, the, who's involved. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm. Um, and also the identities of the people that, mm. are, that are in the paintings, mm. like whether they were considered mm. or not considered. Mm. Um, yeah, I think these have become very important issues to discuss today. Yeah. I would personally prefer to watch the artwork from the left because somehow this one shows me like whatever disagreements they have all settled and compromise reached already. Yeah, so I would see it from here to here. For me, it was more logical this, because this, they are not even facing each other and it's just a hand on the back. Mm. Then this one, at least they're mm. tolerating each other because I have a contentious tolerating. relationship with my mother as well. So uh-huh. I understand this mm. and I finally frame. The last photograph is the one that really completes this picture for me but it is not like super happy butterflies and all that like rosy. It's still there is a tension I feel like yeah, this is a compromise toleration more than a full acceptance I feel.
I agree with you. I feel the same thing mm. that uh, they have reached some kind of compromise and they are hugging each other. But I can still see that the hug is not really a close, tight hug. Like they are just holding each other lightly. And I can't see Amanda's face. So I'm not mm. sure if the face is still the same face. It's like, mm. okay, I'm hugging my mother. Mm. Uh, but I'm not really keen to hug, but I'll just do it. Mm. I, I'm not sure. But somehow it still tells me that there's some compromise because of the closeness mm. as compared with the second picture. Mm. Mm. Where there is a clear divide, right? Yeah. I have that had that journey with my own mum. So this was very meaningful like in the sense that she portrayed it. In the Chinese culture also not much touching involved and that makes sense, you know, like from the back. And then this is also not such a warm embrace. I think one of the things I picked up from these three photographs is that notion of touch. Mm. How, which, whichever way you read it, I think if you read it from the left, mm. then there's this very gentle, you know, contact on the back. Mm. It's kind of like a support, but it's also like a pet. You know, it's very, very soft. And then the distancing, and then the coming together, which is a more kind of committed embrace. Um, so it's like almost like a change in the way contact and touch um, has evolved in this story. Mm. And my impression would be that she has a, a hand on the back and it feels more like a support. It doesn't look like a push. Maybe, like you said, a, a slight tap. Mm. Yeah, it's like, okay, I've got your back. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I think it's also a gesture of concern. Mm. We rarely touch someone's back unless there's a certain sentiment of being there for someone. Mm. And I always like to see wrinkled skin photo, uh, pho on photo close-ups. Uh. It's just like a terrain, you know. It's always very, very beautiful. Yeah, but every day I look down to see whether mine is becoming like that. Can you look at mine? Oh, it's a terrain. Like a beautiful Close terrain. Up, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Close up. I think it's also quite fun that it's open for mm. all kinds of readings mm. that, you know, we don't... Even though the, the artist had this intention, but you can mm. always read works very differently. Whenever I see this piece by Amanda Heng, it always triggers off my memories of having made the stories of a woman in her diary, which is an installation that I did at Grey Projects in 2019, which is my contentious relationship with my grandmother. Um, and that difference in the generation's attitudes towards womanhood and marriage, mm. and how this tension you know, has evolved over time as well. And I always meet you know, people who have seen the work, if they're from you know, of a different generation, they, they see either, you know, the, my grandmother's perspective mm. or my mother's perspective caught between the two mm. or like my perspective. So it's like three different layers. Mm. So I wonder how the audiences back in the time when Amanda did this work responded to the work. Like what did they see? Because we see it, I think, I imagine we see it very differently now. Mm. Yeah. And how this tension between familiar relations can mm. kind of, you know, it's can continue and evolve as a story as well. What struck me most about the three pieces of artwork that we saw today actually was the confidence in which I could see being portrayed by all the three women. Like the first one that we saw, which was the Serene Jade, how she did that yoga pose and she seemed so comfortable and so confident in the pose. And then we moved on to Bali and that lady at the loom, she was like sitting nice and tall and showing off her assets. She wasn't ashamed. And also when we moved on to Amanda Hing's um, photographs, you could see her picture was almost perfectly framed in the picture frame mm. itself. Mm. I definitely feel this uh, with the shifting tides of how uh, women are getting more and more agency in um, the way our bodies are represented, whether in art and media. It is a good shift, I feel. Like, I, I learned that we've come a long way about how women are portrayed in art. And actually, seeing uh, Serene Jade was also very to know that you know that friendship that they had. That's why I think that as an artwork spoke out spoke to me. And also, I, I'm looking forward to women having more agency over their bodies representation in art. Yeah, 
I really enjoy this process of looking at artworks together um, and that everyone has such a different perspective about the same work that both of you have already brought up. I feel that you know that's kind of what art sh should be in that it is open to anyone to you know kind of have a narrative over it, to think about it and it's not some kind of elitist activity where oh, there's only one uh, interpretation or one definition of what it should be. I also really enjoy like sharing the artist's intentions behind the work, which can be very different because we're living in a different time, we're reading it very differently, um, and you know, it's more of a communal experience. <laughs>